and kick off the, the event, but you need to take a mic. Yeah. And then pass it to Ralph. I'll pass it to Alexandra and then to Ralph. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I am thrilled, I am very emotional. First of all, the topic and the interest that it attracted and this wonderful audience. Then I am very thrilled to have this in Kharkiv. It needs a challenging discussion at this level. I do not claim to be an expert among such people, but I do wish to ask some questions because I need answers. One of uh, German famous philosophers said, and I like this quotation, the level of state is determined by the level of personalities. The lower are personalities, the lower is the state, and the opposite is true. I believe this when I hear about the crisis. Start discussing. Danity from Berlin with his input, and then we'll kick off the discussion. So, thanks a lot. I'm happy to be back in Kharkiv again after some years. Unfortunately, only for a very short um, trip, but um, I hope to be back. Why are we talking about the crisis of liberal democracy? Of course, this is not a very encouraging question, but I would share the uh, approach of Oleg that we should not only face uh, the challenges, but also look for the opportunities which are inherently in, in this long crisis. To understand the situation a little bit better, which we are in today, maybe it's useful to compare it with this very happy moment 25 years ago after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989-1990 and this series of colored revolutions in Central Eastern Europe, this big wave of freedom, democracy, um, a unified Europe with lots of hope. This was the moment the, the American intellectual Francis Fukuyama called the end of history. Of course, this didn't mean that nothing will happen no more. The sense of the, the end of history was there will be no more systemic competition. Liberal democracy has finally won. This is now the direction the whole world more or less will follow. The combination of the market economy or capitalism and uh, liberal political constitution. And today the situation has changed dramatically. We are faced with a kind of double challenge. First, the challenge by authoritarian regimes, which are acting more and more self-assertive. China, Russia, in a different way Iran, and their followers all around the world. And the promise of these authoritarian regimes, especially China, is prosperity, progress, and stability without democracy. They don't see themselves long as, uh, no more longer as kind of transition countries towards a liberal democracy. They see themselves as adversaries. And they are challenging the model of liberal democracy. And the next, maybe even more worrying challenge comes from within, from the very core of the liberal democratic world in Europe and the United States. The wave of right-wing populism, of nationalist and xenophobic and authoritarian 
movements in our countries. And of course, they had some, I would say, major blows for the liberal democracy in the last years. It started in Europe with Brexit, the Brexit decision, which was not only a decision to leave the EU, it was much more and much deeper. It was a kind of revolt against the liberal elites by parts of the British society, especially parts of the working class and people who had the feeling to be left behind. And then, of course, the election of Donald Trump in, in, the, in, the, in, in the United States. Unbelievable, you know, the, the country which more or less invented modern than democracy together with the French then revolution in 1789. Now with a, a president who is openly attacking the values of liberal democracy and the liberal international order of multilateral cooperation. But also in Europe, if you're looking to Hungary and Poland, the idea of illiberal democracy is rising, which in my view is a contradiction in itself. There is no democracy without liberalism. And also in Western Europe, if you're looking to, to Italy or Austria, you know, this kind of right-wing nationalist xenophobic parties now taking them over the government, but it's more or less all over the place from Scandinavia to the Mediterranean Sea. These kind of parties around 15 to 30% 30, 30 in, the, in the general elections. And there's a growing, I would say, mistrust in democratic institutions and parties and a growing public discontent in our countries. So what has happened? What has then going wrong? I think basically beyond a lot of political mis uh, mistakes and, and wrong decisions which had been, been made over the last 20 years, but that's normal. That belongs to every young democracy. Democracy is about trial and error. But basically, we are confronted with an era of, I would say, modernization uh, at speed. An era of accelerated and fundamental change. Economic globalization, which is about structural economic change in our countries. The digital revolution, and we are only in the beginning of this very fundamental technological then innovation which will change our then economies and our, our everyday life very fundamentally. Global migration, and of course, especially the refugee crisis in 2015, 2016, with more than one million refugees from the Middle East uh, and um, Central Asia coming to, to Europe, most of them to Germany. And finally, I would add the gender revolution which is going on, the decline of the patriarchalic family, uh, women's rights, uh, gender equality, uh, equal rights for homosexuals, um, and all of that, these kind of economic and cultural changes, they are creating a sense of insecurity in our societies, a sense of stress, of social and cultural and economic stress. And this goes along with an increased polarization. We have a divide, especially in the Western societies, between winners and losers of this modernization process. Those who feel very comfortable and who benefit from these changes, especially the well-educated younger generation, young people who are speaking uh, several languages, who are internationally connected, who are highly mobile, uh, and on the other hand, you have parts of our society who, who feel threatened by these young fundamental changes. And the anti-liberal parties and movements, they are giving a voice to these parts of our societies, to these parts of our people 
than who feel more and more left behind and, and excluded <coughs> from this kind of modernization and the liberal progress uh, we are confronted with. So the big challenge, if we want to defend and renew liberal democracies and want to, to gain more support by the broad public, is to bridge the gap between these liberal, globalist, cosmopolitan Zang elites and these parts of our Zang society who are more wishing um, and, and longing for security, for belonging to a greater community, who uh, need kind of uh, social solidarity. Um, and this is basically, I would say, about four major political areas we have to, to address. The first one, to make it brief, is empowering people. Empowering people to deal in a, in a self-assertive way with these changes. And of course, this is very much about education and professional qualification. So we have to offer uh, than much better than education, and not only for young ones, also for people in their middle and elder uh, than ages, um, to keep pace with these young changes we are confronted with. The second then answer is um, the renewal of the social contract of our societies, basic delivering basic social securities, people cannot act freely if they are full of fear. If they fear um, poverty and social exclusion, um, they are vulnerable to all kind of authoritarian lung temptations and, and authoritarian offers, especially to nationalism. So the renewal of the social con contract and a new economic model of inclusive growth, this is absolutely key. Uh, not only uh, advantage for the few, but progress for the many. And a third element uh, is uh, restoring trust in public institutions, in the democratic institutions. Uh, and this is not only about um, a new generation of responsible politicians, it is very much about um, <coughs> the division of powers, an independent um, and f just judiciary, an independent and free press, a free and vivid civil society, um, this is absolutely then key to, to restore public institutions, in, including our then public infrastructure, from the educational system to then public uh, transport and uh, the law and order then system. This is basically to restore trust and to create a sense of stability and security in times of change. And and my assumption would be that these then, challenges and these questions are even more urgent in societies like Ukraine, who are experiences now more than 30 years of turmoil, more than 30 years of disruptive change. Um, and I think we have to restore the, the, the trust of people in the ability of democratic institutions, of government and democratic parties, that we are able to deal with these changes in a responsible way. Thanks. So, uh, please, Mike, uh, Ralph, and I uh, present all the participants.
I would like to represent all the uh, delegates. Um, this was the start of the discussion. Uh, Mr. Zura Balasanya, he is managing director of the institution who, which restores trust. Mr. Serhiy Jadan, uh, Ukrainian writer. And uh, citizen of Kharkiv, I think the most popular one, uh, and Mr. Sushko, Alexander Sushko, who is managing director of International Charitable uh, Renaissance Foundation, and he is expert on Euro-Atlantic relations. Uh, my name is Natalia Minyuk. Uh, I am from Hromatsky Television. Uh, we are right now broadcasting this uh, event for English-speaking uh, um, viewers. And to start the discussion, I would like to to uh, mention a question uh, that we asked people. So what the uh, publicity would like to ask uh, the delegates here. Uh, the great um, amount of this question was about the disappointment. So when people are disappointed, maybe it is better to, um, uh, to move within the authoritarian way. Uh, maybe the uh, security is not possible uh, with the freedom of speech. So these were the questions. Uh, that the Ukrainians who wanted to ask you. And it is understandable that we have a number of questions concerning uh, how Ukrainians see democracy. So this is why I would like to ask you this question. So I would like to ask you about the reasons of these processes. Uh, there are some social researchers, uh, Stephen Levitsky, Luke and Wade, who um, already uh, um, got the formula of uh, authoritarian totalitarianism, and uh, Ukraine was the um, uh, example of it uh, when countries um, compete with one another, and when one uh, country wins, it uh, acts like an authoritarian country. Uh, I will not um, argue that Ukraine is a democracy, but uh, how it is being managed, uh, many people uh, in their uh, heart or um, in their core are not um, Democrats. Uh, and this people cannot join the club. So please uh, speak into the microphone because we have a broadcasting with interpreting. So Sergei, you will be the first one to speak maybe. Good afternoon, dear friends. Um, I am not an expert on democracy. This is why I will be, uh, I, I will speak metaphorically. I've been thinking how democracy is being seen in Ukraine, how uh, principles uh, of liberal democracy are being seen in Ukraine. I think that generally speaking for Ukrainians, for our politicians and for our authorities who come and go, <coughs> these notions, liberal democracy, or liberal values, or demo democratic values, are something um, something uh, written on icons in the office of some kind of gangster. So uh, you better not touch these things. Uh, let them uh, hang on the walls and um, protect us. Uh, it is very comfortable to uh, use it as uh, masks. It, the people who we call democratic politicians or non-democratic politicians, because uh, but but they can argue with us uh, because it is very uh, vague in Ukrainian political sphere. Who can really be called a dem dem democrat in Ukrainian poli policy? Uh, it is a rhetorical questions maybe. So it is uh, very difficult to speak about it analytically. Uh, we are going to have presidential elections. 
questions. Uh, the candidates are going to speak about their uh, programs, and we can hear any kind of things. We can hear things about army, about language, about church. So this is the three main topics that are actual at the moment. But uh, you are not going to hear anything about liberal democracy, because nobody actually is aware about it. You can speak about uh, the church because it is clear so and you can earn something on that some uh, some um voices or some votes Li but speaking about liberal democracy is just waste of time because nobody understands this notion so to speak about the crisis of liberal democracy in ukrainian policy uh, i really don't know what i have to mention in this context but instead Oh, we mentioned in our discussion how uh, does the crisis of liberal democracy in Europe influence Ukraine. I think this topic or subtopic is a more interesting one because it makes us think about the relations between Ukraine and Europe. Well, since five years we have been speaking about the European choice of Ukraine. <clears throat> politicians in Ukraine, in Europe, are speaking about it constantly. Otherwise, uh, we just don't understand where are we moving to, where are we are moving to. But we have to figure out how, what these relationships are really about. I think that they are very alike um, to the relationships between uh, granddaughter, she is very smart and active, and her grandmother. Uh, the grandmother is a very active, a very active lady too, but um, they are different if you compare her with her granddaughter. There is, these are many differences, and the daughter or the granddaughter is aware of these differences, and she um, makes some tricks. So she just listens to those things uh, her grandmother says that she likes to listen to. Um, and mm, sometimes she understands that. But the grandmother has her own problems, and she don't have. Uh, she doesn't have to listen to some things she says. Uh, they are really from one family. They love one another on the one hand, but on the other hand, you may see uh, that the granddaughter is constantly trying to make to play a trick on her grandmother, and. And the grandmother cannot figure out why does her granddaughter react this way. Um, when we speak about European values, dem democracy values, we uh, are meaning everything by that. If you ask uh, any Ukrainian what are European values about, uh, Ukrainians are going to speak about good medicine, good education, and gr good big supermarkets with uh, high quality products. Um, but if you speak about something in terms of uh, your um, um, about your responsibilities, about the laws, about um, following the laws, things that are also uh, element to democratic values. In my opinion, this is a result of a lack of experience. We cannot understand of our all little experience what it, democracy is about. We cannot see the difference between the today's Greece and today's Sweden. But there is a great gap between these two societies. Um, or if you take Poland, today's Poland, they have a very different trends uh, that can be seen as dangerous f for both Ukrainians and Europeans. We cannot understand what is going on in Britain and why uh, this is happening. We see the Europe as a grandmother that has to support us, that has to help us. Um, when the International Monetary Fund give us uh, credits and uh, wants to see from our side something instead, we are trying to um, damn them and curse them. 
And if uh, the leader of France comes to football championship to Russia, we are uh, eager to curse him. And why? Because we uh, watch Russian television and we watch this broadcasting. Um, these relations uh, between granddaughter and her grandmother, lack of experience, lack of knowledge, and lack of personal experience, that is what it is about. Uh, the Ukrainians who go to, Uk to uh, Europe and who see the problems of Europe and see that liberal democracy uh, is not something from the Bible, it, it is something you have to deal with in your day-to-day -day life. And to make a conclusion of my chaotic speech, I would like to note when we speak about the values crisis, I agree with previous speaker, Tatiana. I think the values crisis is present both in Ukraine and in Europe. But the range and nature of the crisis is different in both um, places, because Europe and Ukraine um, taken separately remind me of two marathon runners. Uh, the one is on the third, so you, you, Europe is on the 30th kil kilometer of the road, and we are on this third kilometer. Uh, we have another range of crisis, and we have to be aware of it. Uh, Natalia um, speaks of Ukraine as a democratic country, and the choice uh, of uh, Europe for Ukraine is not something abstract. But uh, we really have a different understanding of many things. It is obvious for me. What does it mean? It means that we have to communicate more. Zorab, I will add, it will be the same question, but uh, I will ask the Ukrainian society sees itself differently now? We are not so much about democracy as about well-being. So all this, you know, election and when we were speaking about European values, we meant well-being. Yes, I agree. So to answer your first question, as a journalist, I must be cynical. I wouldn't say that if I was speaking first. Democracy for our politicians is just uh, like clothes. We can change clothes. Just like, uh, you know, safety belt in the car. People don't wear it. Or if, when they wear it, they're not sure it will work. As for the crisis, you know, I am not a young person, and what I have seen in the last 15 years, I won't say that it's failure and defeat, but I can say that the world has been changing extremely fast. Just like Ralph said, we experience development, we can be co-authors with the West, with Europe, co-authors of the future. That system which will be less illusional, uh, that will take into account the mistakes of the past. It may not be simple. Perhaps some values will have to be defended. Perhaps a new edition of the known values will appear. It's important that turbulence doesn't get too high. This is where the risk is higher. But at the same time, it is a chance for new historical creativity. And it's better than just following the existing mo model. And Ukraine is a part of this historic process. This is where I see an opportunity to 
get out of this crisis. We will have to spend a lot of energy for something that we thought was solved. But it's not a surprise for Ukraine. Five years ago, we saw that some issues that had been solved, it seemed, turned out to be unsolved. So it is a new chance with higher risks. And we must be aware that planning the future may take us not where we would like to go. So we need to see the way before us, but we should understand that there is no guarantee that the final destination may not be what we want it to be now. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't plan our future, otherwise other people will plan it for us. To Ralph, because uh, still there is a need of the role models. Uh, it's not just about the West. So I'm curious. You made your input, but uh, when you look at the, you know, after like all the elections you've mentioned, you know, you felt that the liberal kind of opposition or whatever you name the Democratic Party in in the U.S. or anybody else were kind of mourning. It's already a couple of years when they are complaining, complaining and complaining. And uh, we are looking and three years, almost like three years after Brexit, you don't see kind of I new ideas. You go to the States, you still see very few new ideas. So maybe we just don't see them. When you look around Europe, do you see these ways to connection, to connect rural and urban, to, to empower uh, beyond this, uh, as this kind of the uh, intellectual discussions we have now, but like real and which are maybe on the regional or local level are working? Probably we are still in the process of getting a better understanding what's going on. But I would agree that um, it, it's, it's urgent that we are come out from mourning and uh, deliberation uh, to political action. We have to deliver. Liberal democracies have to deliver. I would not blame uh, the majority of people who are mainly interested in their well-being, in their everyday life, in healthcare, or the pension system, or public transport, or their, their, their jobs. These are legitimate concerns and interests. And liberal democracies um, have to care for these needs of people and to give answers to the, the needs of people in very challenging times, you know, when we no longer can relay, re rely on the old answers. Uh, uh, we are entering a new and partly unknown future. And we have to, I would say, basically to, to renew our institutions, our public institutions, to be able to deal with this rapid and fundamental change. So bridging the gap between freedom and security, this is, for me, a key challenge. We have to, to, to give answers to as liberal than, uh, Democrats. Um, addressing the need for, as you mentioned, um, for belonging, that, that you are part of a bigger community which uh, provides kind of solidarity. Yeah, that you are not be left alone. These are the basic human the needs and, 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 and concerns. And if we ignore them or if we neglect them, then can be turned in weapons against the liberal democracy. Um, so all of us who are concerned about the, the future of liberal democracy, of individual freedom, of minority rights, 
uh, of political pluralism, um, then we, we have to address these social concerns in a, in a very serious way. Um, and finally, we have to deliver. Yeah? It's not only about talking about values. It's uh, about real policies. Um, and I uh, hope, I'm sure that we are going to have very particular questions about uh, solutions, but, uh, but uh, I would like to ask Sergei Zurab. I really got a list of questions I would like or people would like to ask you, people uh, would like to ask you how to overcome the trend of uh, uh, right movements in Ukraine, uh, how to protect human rights in Ukraine. In the Ukrainian discourse of civil society, uh, from, uh, from human rights activists, they mention uh, words like uh, left or right. Uh, we never have heard anything about this because we really fought, Ukrainian dissidents who were not communists, uh, really fought for, for freedom and for dem democracy. But this rhetoric is really toxic in our society. How can we deal about it and how can you explain uh, this fact? Is it really a risk? Um, and even the intellectuals um, ask who is left and who is right instead of uh, speaking of uh, real things and living in, within this discourse. I disagree with you that it uh, only emerged today and uh, it was not present before the war. Uh, there was uh, this opposition between left, the left and the right. Uh, but I think this was the extreme situation. It is extreme situation right now as well, but the focus of uh, public attention is so deformed due to mass media, by the way. These uh, various marginal actions um, are being uh, spoken about and focused on. But these things existed before the wars, and I think that both parties, uh, the, the links and the rights, uh, the left and the rights, they like it. It is a kind of game, but today this game is not being adequate. Uh, from moral point of view, because um, you may speak about real life or real death, and playing this game and um, asking one another and competing with one another who is a better patriot of Ukraine is not that fair. But you also may see that uh, those who play these games are actually the same people who used to play it before the war. So this is my opinion. Uh, Surab, do you agree? Well, your television or your broadcasting company has uh, its principles. But when we follow the discussion three years ago and uh, this year, we can hear more and more of accusation that uh, the mass media have shown us this or they have shown us that. <coughs> I think this focus of attention has shifted a little bit, and we did not uh, pay attention on it. I will use the metaphor of Sergei about uh, granddaughter and grandmother. The grand daughter is naturally interested where uh, what she has to do. Not uh, she's not particularly interested in uh, grandmother's businesses. I can face the fact that uh, this family drama, when it comes to time that somebody offends uh, the uh, granddaughter, but not the grandmother, but the uh, elder brother has to protect the granddaughter. This is... Uh, um, the way to explain how I see this. Uh, this is the way 
we uh, see the fact that we are being attacked by the, by a force, and we have to uh, fight the force. I've been listening to Mr. Uh, Fuchs and uh, to your question. It is really um, a risky question. What uh, does democracy has to offer us? But Ralph could not give us any new answer. Um, Similarly to the democracy all over the world, democracy is only looking for these answers, but democracy has not found these answers. Mm, if you uh, see Putin, Erdogan, and Trump, the, these are just very blunt people that just want to uh, to. Uh, manage the world instead of this grandmother because the grandmother is already old and weak. But speaking about the right and left uh, people, I think it is about the media. I agree with uh, Serhii. Uh, there is a reform in the media with, uh, the, within the country, and we have uh, actually very little idea about the media in the whole world. And we can really focus on uh, false kind of questions so f uh, as medium. Actually, my answer was a different one. I was speaking about the real situation in the light, uh, right and left uh, uh, society or groups. But you spoke about the pro projection of these both discourses. The projection has uh, really changed. It has broadened and uh, entered those marginal groups into the broad society. Uh, the flags of Ukrainian um, um, the, the so on UPA uh, are being hanged out um, by different people. This is already a new metaphor, um, the metaphor of Ukrainian and Russian war, the war for Ukrainian independence. Um, I think that this has already little connection to the original meaning of this flag. You cannot interpret it, it as a broadening of uh, a marginal uh, trends. Um, it looks like I'm also um, arguing for these things, but it is, it, this is not like that. And the link discourse and link idea, those two notions, you mentioned them. You may call link anybody you don't like, or left you, anybody you don't like. This is a very uh, good way to hurt uh, somebody. People cannot protect against this. If you are being called uh, left, you just feel wrong. And you may be called left person on and on again. But uh, if these people who are being called left ones uh, are really in connection with real social de democrats or social party, this is a rhetorical question. Uh, you may call anybody left. Uh, if you are pro-president, you are left, or contra-president, you are left. If you ignore all those situations, you, are le you can be called left as well. Um, this is populism, and this is uh, something that can be f very, uh, th th they can be fought very difficultly. And this is a manipulative trick, and you can fight manipulation using a, f a fair approach. If you try to speak with your op with your counterpart using fair uh, arguments, he or she manipulates on and on. I would ask you, Alexander, to also reflect on that. Your Renaissance Fund is well known, and it's surprising that there is new rhetoric against George Soros. So the values of open society, what do you think about it? 
And what do you think about delivering solutions? Your fund and you personally have worked with reforms and reformers, young reformers, a lot. Do you see that they are capable of some real action? Can you make this public policy? Because democracy is not just nice words. People need roads. You have to make roads. You have to provide. You have to deliver something tangible. So it's it's true that people don't believe that new politicians don't have teams or their teams are not capable of practical solutions. They have ideology, but don't, don't have skills to do something practical. As for branding and manipulative accusations, yes, we are used to that. We were called the, the world government, shadow government, our Renaissance Fund, have read so many things about Soros. But neo-Marxist is a new term which is used in Ukraine now. It's a new meme. What does it have to do with us? But, you know, some people, some read about some neo-Marxists, and now they are talking about this, that there's no liberal democracy, it's an illusion, but these people are neo-Marxists, and that the Western society was devised by neo-Marxists, by these cunning enemies. So this is the conspiracy theory world, and it's fed by new ideas and memes, but it's evident that we need to we need to know that there are people who are immune to arguments. They will manipulate whatever you think because they are not out to find the truth. Although there is a but there is a large group of neutral people who don't have solid uh, principles. These people should be won over. These people can become victims of uh, informational manipulations. These people may believe these stories and interpretations. That's why public communication is important. That's why our fund is open to such uh, meetings and open discussions. Uh, Natalka asked a question, and uh, Sergei and Zurab answered this question. On the one hand, I cannot support what you said, that the situation is the same as it used to be in the whole world as in Ukraine, there is a tendency of the right flank growing. No, I would say both flanks are getting stronger. I wouldn't say that the ultra-right sentiments are growing. I would determine, I would define it in a different way, that the middle, the center, is shrinking. This is the foundation of the democratic governance. And we can see in many democratic countries that the center is growing small, but the ultra-nationalists, ultra-right and ultra-left, these both flanks are growing. And these both flanks are cynical towards basic values of liberal society. They disrespect these values. We can see that in the results of elections. We will see it in Ukraine during the next elections. We will see that these uh, flanks, these extremes, will get more votes. And this is part of the process. We need to 
understand there is no specific Ukrainian answer to this problem. We need to see it in a larger context. In this sense, I think we have good news as well. In Ukraine, from the very beginning, we did not allow some extremes, for example, the factor of national identity. Uh, in the West, many people regret it. That's why Orban and, and his philosophy, these are the challenges because those people say that Europe neglects uh, nationality. But our Renaissance fund, the meaning itself is not referring to artistic Renaissance, but we were talking about the renovation, resurrection of our national identity. Remember, we had this term for decades, national democrats. So national and democratic in our history was very united. And I think this is positive baggage of Ukraine. We had not divisions and antagonism between the national and the democratic. And this is what we need to protect. And we should not allow these two concepts to be antagonized then we will not have this except exceptional conflicts. Conflicts are okay as long as they are as long as they stay within the borders. So this is what we have. I understand that people don't want to wait. They have one life and you cannot keep convincing yourself that these are long-term processes. But then, otherwise, we are always disappointed because if we wait, if we expect short-term solutions from processes that are long-term processes, they need education, they need investment, quality governance, for example. I would be happy to change the modern political class. There's only one problem, but there is no counter elite. There is nowhere to be found a new political class. And people who are forming new parties, they, they know that. We communicate with people who are looking for human resources to create a new project, for example. They all regret this. Their main concern is not oligarchs, the main concern is there isn't enough human resources, quality people who would create that critical mass for change. So these motivated reformers, they constitute only a small part in the existing ruling class. Some people say that the political class is very conservative, social lifts do not work, people are not allowed to enter. But no, this is not the case. We have been trying to help reformers, and we realized that human potential is very limited. To come to the system of state administration, state governments, on the conditions that exist. For people who are not corrupted, who do not go there to get their corruption rent, it's not happening. There is no massive influx of trained people. So after helping reformers for many years, I can say that what is necessary, it's necessary to be prepared. This process takes longer. We should be prepared that these problems will not be solved by one political event, by one election. Sustained processes are needed. These processes will form quality political class on different levels. Steps have been taken, but 
the result is not at present satisfactory to the society. But it doesn't mean that we should forgo this approach. Short remarks to, to the discussion. The first, from my view and my experience, I would say forget about left and right. These are more and more shallow shells, or hollow, hollow shells. Um, the, the new conflict line is not about left and right. It is about open societies and closed societies. It's about liberalism and authoritarian uh, thinking. It's about a more internationalist view and a nationalist than attitude. And you can find both on the traditional right and left, you, you can find both positions. Um, and I would agree very much uh, with Alexander that the challenge is to strengthen the democratic center of our political landscape. Um, the center not in the sense of um, kind of dull and, and uh, unpassionate uh, and, and poorly pragmatic sense. I think the center has to be um, very like, dy dynamic and forward-looking and uh, we have to be energetic, not just defending the status quo, but, but uh, like developing a, f uh, um, a vision for the future. Um, to, to restore trust, which has been a key word in, in, the, in, in the conversation up to now, is not just trust in institutions and trust in, in parties or trust in democracy, it's about trust in the future. That we will be able to shape the future, to influence it. Um, and not just to be victims of developments we, we, we cannot influence, we cannot shape. Democracy is about shaping the future is to is about collective reasoning and collective action uh, to uh, then create the future and not just uh, to, um, to to suffer then from uh, developments we, we cannot we, we cannot influence the second remark is um, about the tension between short-term expectations and long-term developments or long-term processes. Of course, it's, it's true to uh, reform state like in, in, in Ukraine and to renew the economy and to rebuild institutions. That needs time. It takes time. And to renew the political class then takes time. But I would say not to lose the, 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 the public support. Um, you, you need kind of short-term small progress in certain areas. Is it decentralization or judiciary reform or the educational system or the public transport? You need kind of small, visible, tangible progress uh, to encourage people to have the stamina for the long-term than, than processes. So, um, and finally, um, there is an, um, a, a junction, there is a connection between the domestic conflicts we are fighting and the international conflicts we are fighting. If you are looking to the European arena, to the European broader Zang landscape. There is a very close interconnection between um, the uh, political Zang elite in Russia, the, 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 the Kremlin, and all these kind of right-wing and left-wing populist forces in Europe. They are forming a new kind of anti-liberal international. They are cooperating very, very closely. And Russia has becoming a, a domestic political factor, also in Western Europe. If you're looking to uh, Russian propaganda outlets, uh, partly the official one, uh, the state media like than Russia Today, which is quite an influence than, than media than outlet now in, in uh, different European countries, 
and of course all this in informal informational warfare um, with uh, fake news and all these uh, then kind of social media uh, then propaganda this is uh, a, a challenge we are forcing them together. So um, we have at the same time to, to renew our then domestic then institutions and uh, to be the aware that uh, we have to contain in a, in a certain way then Russia. Um, not allowing them to destabilize the, the European institutions and to undermine uh, the, the, the trust in uh, the, the, the European uh, Union. Um, and this, is, this should be in an area of cooperation between the EU and Ukraine. Zorab, it could be strange if I would, um, if would not ask this question. It is about how to strengthen the center, how to restore trust, and the broadcaster, the public broadcaster, is this task. Uh, all over the world, your colleagues uh, think about uh, restoring and managing this center because everybody is um, willing to uh, escape somewhere. You are moving in some kind of a magic circle. You need to get money to attract more people. Um, how do you or your team, uh, how do you see some new ways to Yes, really, you have uh, the law according to which uh, the state has to finance you, but you don't get the enough financing. How can you restore trust uh, with the publicity? Uh, this question is not about public broadcast only, but it's a question about liberal democracy. I would like to pick up that ball that uh, Ralph started talking about, he was talking just exactly about what we are doing. We have long-term plans. You cannot, you cannot give birth to a child sooner than it was determined by nature. In society, it's the same way. Sometimes it takes generations to change things. Ukraine, in this very short time, three, four years, has covered so much ground. You know, people don't have enough patience for everything. This is what public broadcaster is doing now. I was looking for answers myself. That's why when Ralph was talking, I was expecting him to say, what are the new things, new solutions that democracy can provide? So yes, I agree. We need to show some short-term effects. We have our own jargon, we call this flashlights, that we need to show our audience. And we understand that these are not fundamental processes, it's, but we need to show something for our audience. We understand that the real changes are happening deep beneath and they are not seen to the general public. So we are doing this, both processes. Natalka, there are no other ways. You know, local journalists told me that if I move to Kiev, it will take me a long time to build my own networks of connections. I have been in Kiev for four years, and my 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 progress was the opposite. I was cutting my networks of connections because all those connections with our politicians 
they work in this way. You help me and I'll help you. It doesn't work the other way. So how can we get money from them if they tell me in return, what will you give us in return? I'm not prepared for these compromises. So we will not change these principles. Otherwise, there is no sense in the public broadcaster. So I would like to ask this question to Ralph and to you. You talked about public broadcasters in other countries, and they have questions. What can we say in response to these young and uh, arrogant players? Do we have some new proofs that we can show to society? Bob had asked, and I, I'll have something to say. Do you see, you can have, yeah, because like there was a question, do you see that you have this answer, especially for the public <coughs> broadcasters? There's an in interesting, and in, in, in my view, promising uh, development going on um, both in the US and in, in, in Western Europe, that in the last years, the interest in, I would say, quality journalism is rising again. This is a kind of reaction of people to to these, um, uh, yeah, f fake news, disinformation, and um, the I would say the uh, crossing, yeah, crossing the lines between journalism and propaganda. So uh, there is a growing, uh, growing interest in um, quality journalism, and uh, so it's not only about public, but uh, public broadcasting plays an enormous role in that because it's if 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 it if, if the circumstance if the framework um, is uh, done right, it provides a much higher degree of independence, <laughs> independence from big money, and independence from big government. Uh, but of course, you need this kind of legal legal uh, framework, which provides uh, also the necessary funds to the, the public, than broadcasting, and this is part of what I'm talking about: um, the the need for strong public institutions. Uh, public broadcasting is is part of the public uh, domain. Is uh, th this is about us? It's not about the state. It's about civil society. And I think we have to create the, 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 the understanding and the sense for the value of these public institutions uh, which belong to, to the, the people. This is part of the democratic republic. Я дозволю відповісти, бо воно пов'язане з питанням, яке я потім і Сергію, і решті хотіла... I will say... So I understand financial issues are important. At Hromadske tele Television, we do some research, commercial television and commercial media, because of the cl clickability, is, uh, it depends on the extremes. Journalists must not be lazy, of course, they need to be creative in how they raise money. The audience, uh, international research and investigative journalism, it's mostly financed by donors, by uh, by helpers 20 years ago in USA you would not allow you would not be able to say that you have a donor now it's normal the second question i would say that the only 
solution is to show the country, go as far as possible away from the capital and show what is happening in the country. The media must not be considered part of this elite. When I was when I was in the United States, I was shocked that what you see on CNN and you go into the countryside, into small towns, and you see that this is not what they show on mainstream TV. So the only solution is go out to the people and show these people to these people, not some elite in Kiev, but show other people. Unfortunately, the capital is uh, treated like an entertainment center. People don't see themselves. A question to Sergei as a Kharkovian and as a writer. You show life outside of the big centers. What can you say about this widening gap between Kiev and the rest of the country? I communicate with different politicians, both young and old. They are looking for voters that would fit them. It's interesting that they are not satisfied with voters. They are trying to find new, new voters. So, Alexander, what can you say about this? How can you pull out politicians from the urban environment so that they go out and see the real voters? Is there a gap? Yes, definitely there is a gap. You know, journalists call me and say, can you come to our studio? And I ask them, what city are you from? And they are shocked. Uh, of course we're in Kiev, and where are you? Aren't you in Kiev? So Kiev-centered <coughs> journalism is a reality. It's not even offending me anymore. It's just ridiculous. So they are calling me, inviting me. They don't even know where I live. But I don't think it's the most important problem. There are many gaps. It's not just uh, a gap between Kiev and the rest of the country. Our country is awfully segmented. Our society is divided by many lines on many levels, politically, economically, socially, language-wise, regional divisions. And this hurts us a lot. When I was what I was saying in the beginning, I was not just talking about ourselves, because we are connected, we have similar views, we speak about liberal democracy, and uh, we have more or less the same idea of uh, liberal democracy. But imagine farmers in Luhansk region. They get their news from five, seven national channels, broadcasters, or they read newspapers three or five days after the day of publication. You know, we have these gadgets, we can follow the news in real time. So these are different levels of perception and different models of existence in society. Five years ago, by default, we reached a certain consensus, a certain agreement. We came out into the streets. Ideas of liberal democracy were the foundation, the common basis that united the Maidan. But I disagree. Everybody went out to the Maidan with their own idea. Some people wanted a conservative development. Some people wanted some radical changes. Other people thought about economic transformations. And 
other people thought about liberal democracy. But by default, we accepted that we have differences, but we have some basic values, and we went out to the Maidan. We are concerned about different things, and we get closed in our own closed communities, our echo chambers and uh, these cells where we are communicating with like-minded people. So this is a huge challenge. How to gap, how to bridge these gaps? We are fragmented, isolated, and we are very uh, vulnerable. It's so easy to scare us, to manipulate us. It's so easy to feed these populist slogans to us. We get uh, dragged into these games and plays between the right and the left because we are so isolated, because we are closed. But we are satisfied because you sit in your comfort zone, you don't have to go out. You know, you go out into the street, there is a living human being, can you ban them? No, you cannot ban them, and it's very uncomfortable. So we are getting used to being comfortable. Discussion is not only voicing your opinion, but it's listening, at least listening to another viewpoint. After that, you can ban somebody, but at least listen to them. This function of listening to your opponent, your uh, interlocutor, this function is not uh, functioning anymore, unfortunately. Alexander, I would like to uh, stress again, when you spoke about the Kiev centrism, uh, we must also mention the gap between big and small, big cities and small towns. Uh, um, there is a great gap between the access to education to many other services. Excuse me, I, I, am in, uh, I hate to interrupt you, but a uh, small town is a lack of theaters, of libraries, of uh, some things that in either way could influence the intellectual uh, atmosphere. Uh, so speaking about the young ref reformers, um, my concern is, maybe it is your concern as well, sometimes you may get passionate and uh, create reforms in Kiev and when you travel to Berlin and speak at conferences, you can lose the link and understand uh, that speaking about the reforms, you lack of understanding of the reality, uh, how the life is in small towns uh, compared to Kiev. Kiev may be so a part of the new political elite maybe is uh, right now losing this link I'm not speaking about politicians politicians are really don't care about uh, all of uh, what I'm talking about they're living according to under uh, to uh, other principles this is really elitism and this is something that many people are actually sick with. Um, why do we speak about the crisis of liberal democracy, of uh, traditional democracy in the West? Uh, the reason is the same. This uh, link between the elite and society is being undermined. And this is the protest of society when they vote for alternative political powers, because the society does not feel included. So the society uh, makes protest against the older uh, political powers. And <clears throat> Uh, this is also the case here, taking into account uh, our Ukrainian specific and peculiarities, the ones who are driving the reforms forward, um, many of them can say this is not our jobs, especially if you speak about the uh, work of the executive. Um, the members of the parliament, they uh, communicate um, much with uh, 
the people, but um, are they really ready to speak to uncomfortable audiences? This is a question. Uh, but um, speaking of, of our government, I cannot um, say anything about them because their work is really difficult. And this work uh, is being done, but it, it can be difficultly shown to broader publicity. This is something you can uh, not easily sell to uh, publicity. Yes, we surely can talk about, but 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 it's not sexy. It not it's not um, candy you can easily sell. Um, there is no easy answer. It is obvious that. Um, a part of the government has to deal with some kind of promotion, but um, some kind of um, right step, step in right direction is the decentralization process. It is really um, here to overcome this gap, and this is the inclusion mechanism, but the decentralization is also not a perfect mechanism. We lack of high qualified people who could um, not undermine this process from the very beginning. So there is no easy remedy. It is obvious that even making the right steps, the government cannot easily sell these uh, steps to the society. But it doesn't mean that the government shall not try selling them to the society. <coughs> Uh, but uh, if we look at our two days government, we may see that it can communicate some elements of its policy better than the previous governments. But this resource is not um, is not renewable, and we may experience some kind of fatigue. Everybody feels the fatigue from the two days configuration of political power. It cannot last forever. It is obvious democracy is so um, foresees some rotation. But who is going to come instead of the two days politicians? It is a question. Actu actually, uh, those who has been working four or five years in the government are going to leave. But the next generation is actually not in place. I cannot see who is going to come instead of this tr uh, tired <coughs> reformat. So, so we are going to see what the next year is going to bring. Uh, uh, I just want to say, uh, people, just uh, think about your questions. If you would like to ask any question, please, and please keep it brief. Yeah, you can yeah. start. Just um, two remarks. The first, in my view, and, and I think that's not much different in Ukraine to, to other countries, the, the, the next political generation has to come from civil society and it has to come from the municipalities. And if I could uh, give any advice, I would say strengthen local democracy. This is uh, the, the, the very basic fundament of the democracies, because if we, if we are talking about empowering people, giving people the impression that they have a say, that they have a voice, that they can influence things, the main domain is the local, uh, the, the city, the, the, the municipalities. So strengthening municipalities, giving them more competences, giving them more financial resources, uh, this is absolutely uh, crucial for the renewal of uh, the democracy at large. And the second remark was on, and when Sergei was saying that Ukraine is a deeply divided society. I would say to a certain extent, all modern societies are deeply divided. Uh, divided in, in social economic terms, in cultural then, uh, terms, in political then, terms. So democracy is very much about unity in diversity. So bridging the gap between diversity 
and even conflict, conflicting interests and conflicting worldviews and conflicting thang, thang opinions, and creating from these kind of diversity um, a sense of community or of be belonging. So the question is, what connects us and what connects you as a political nation? It's not just the common history. It's not just the common language. It's not just the common culture. No. And it's not as et ethnicity. There are some basic common values and the potential to act together and to create together a common future. I think this is constituting a kind of democratic nation, uh, 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 a nation which is not just um, a destiny. No, it is about acting together. And so the, the, the whole debate is uh, about do we find common values? Do we, do, do we find some common goals for the, uh, the future? Uh, which Ukraine do we want to have in 10 years or 20 years from, from now? And are we able to develop common institutions which bind us together? Common institutions from the parliament and uh, the uh, democratic government to uh, public education, public broadcasting, public transport. These are the elements creating belonging of the different. I would like to illustrate uh, the things that were already mentioned about common, in, uh, about common institutions and the trust. So the illustration will be like that. Uh, the um, election committee, central election committee, has announced it was the first time in Ukrainian history. Um, they announced the election of uh, the new managing director of the Central Election Committee. So the uh, amalgamated territory communities are emerging, and this is the unique um, moment in the history of Ukraine. <coughs> The National Council on Broadcasting addressed me with a, with a question. Can we spread uh, small uh, radio transmitters among the uh, members of some communities? Um, why shall you need it? Um, the answer was the future amalgamated com communities uh, would like to have uh, these transmitters. They cannot allow um, regular transmitters. They still need uh, getting news f uh, um, but the law of Ukraine forbids us to have a share of the broadcasting. Either you pay for all of that or you don't have anything. So we decided to create it like that. Uh, uh, so they can find 10,000 grivna for, um, for the transmitters to pay for that and to pay for the local n news maker and the rest of the uh, time we can broadcast using our license so we cannot guess what our politicians are going to speak about before elections This was practically a power decision. It was for us to to be ready for this kind of decision. This was very, very risky, but it doesn't work in another way. 
Okay, questions from the f from the audience. Please speak into the microphone. Serhii Kasyanov, speaking about crisis of liberal democracy, we need to talk about the reasons, safety, safety, political safety passed away 70 years ago. Generations that remembered how dangerous it is to live during war and occupation, those generations are gone. Now people are more concerned about well-being than safety. So people think, why should we lose profits from uh, trade with Russia, even though we understand that it's uh, a corrupt country? So. Speaking about this post-Soviet territory, f for 70 years, people were taught that loyalty to the ruling class is the prerequisite of safety. And that's why we see that young people share these ideals. It was a commentary and not a question. Your question. My, I have, it's not a question, but maybe I have an answer. You, your thesis was wonderful. You said, why liberal democracy doesn't work in Ukraine? Ukraine is a collider where everything is mixed. And what we have at the output is unpredictable. But the processes in Ukraine are very special. When we want to guess what the outcome will be, it doesn't depend on the political institutions, we need to appeal to archetypes. We need to do archetypical analysis. Those who visit our capital quite often, you must have met Mr. Afonian. He is the head of Ukrainian school of archi archetypes. So he made a positive forecast for Ukraine. He said that creative people will lead Ukraine out of the crisis. It was not a question either, it was a comment. I just want to, to excuse me. I have, unfortunately, to run to a plane which should bring me to um, Israel. No. Uh, so I have to leave. Thank you very much for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So your question now. University of uh, Municipal Economy. I wanted to ask uh, a question to Ralf Füchse, but perhaps you will be able to comment. Germany is one of the world leaders. When Angela Merkel leaves in 2021 and a possible, possible entrance into power of alternative for Germany, what will happen to Germany and to the world? Alexander, I think, will be able to answer this question. Let's see. It's very good that each great politician has a beginning and an end. Angela Merkel cannot complain that her career 
is short. She is perhaps one of the longest ruling politician in Western countries, so this is normal. And those systems are not so much personified. Stability does not depend on one personality, but there is a different challenge. You mentioned one of the radical parties, alternative for Germany, but on the other, on the other side, there is a radical left-wing party. But this is what I was talking. We need, we need the center, while the flanks, the extremes, they use people's fears. My forecast for Germany is that in the short-term perspective, these extreme parties will not come to power in Germany, although there are some processes, changes of configuration happening in the political center. We can see that Green Party is strengthening its position. We saw it at the recent elections. So there is some potential to regroup the political center in Germany. AFD, now they have a good result. In a few years, maybe they will improve their result, but nobody can say. But even if they take more percentage, other parties will not unite with them. The chances that they will be the basis for a coalition are very small, and it's impossible that they will form the government themselves. So the challenge I see is a long-term challenge of diminishing this feeling and destroying that feeling of Germany as a strong, powerful center in Europe. The fear that if Germany loses that status and function as a solidifying center of Europe, who will replace it and what will happen to Europe? So this is not a German problem. Specifically, it's a universal problem. We see that the pendulum is swinging one way. We are, we are discussing this crisis of liberal democracy. But what will be the limit? What will be the stopping point of this tendency? We don't see it now. We, don't, we cannot say it now. This movement towards radicalism that we are discussing today, where are the limits of this movement? Sooner or later, a historic trend will be changed. But when and how, it's a big question. So I have mixed feelings about uh, experienced uh, democratic societies, they have immunity, they have some stability. Even when populists win or when the flanks are increasing its influence, we live in a post-information era. And there are more tools now to destabilize the situation. Western mainstream politicians, they made a mistake because there was a belief that the more information you have, the better. At present, we can see that factors that are working in the opposite direction are uh, also effective. So we see that the number of participants in the information field 
is not always positive. We don't know where these participants in the information field will lead people. So the problem is in the institutions. It seems there is a strong immunity, but how will it be able to adapt to new challenges? How it will be able to change this trend? Uh, and I hope the last question. So, Madam, you've got the microphone. Please, go ahead. My name is Maria Avdeyeva. I research the issues of cyber information security. Uh, so the propaganda and information influence is very interesting for me. So I've got the following question. Uh, these questions uh, usually dealt with uh, by the civil society. The civil society is represented, uh, represented by alternative television, the project like Stop Fake and others. And the state that uh, legally uh, restricts some kind of influences and restricts uh, the possibility of broadcasting or access from the territory to, uh, of Ukraine to certain kinds of resources. My question is the following. Do you think that we, do, that we are doing enough? And where can we do more? Or, as uh, Mr. Zurab said, I is it just uh, bubbles? Can we achieve something more, something more profound by our action? And another question. Uh, often when you speak to European experts, they say what you are doing in the legislative field, it violates the um, um, the right of speech because it restricts the access to information. But still, we have to do it because we are at war. So what do you think about it? Thank you very much. It's the very last question. So please, Mr. Zorab, I will keep it brief. I hope I'll be, I'll be able to keep it brief because your question is very serious. I just don't have any answer. There are historical examples. The Britain, for example, uh, they could prove Contra propaganda does not work. Excuse me, you just ha can read about it. Uh, logically speaking, you re you really have to deal with that. But I don't have any other answer except uh, the experience of other nations. So another short remark I would like to make. Um, logically speaking, if somebody accuses you of disinformation, you have to um, confront it. And this is the magical circle, closed circle. And this makes us uh, stay behind the, the one who makes the propaganda. But I, I'm not, um, I ha don't have the right to speak about it, how to deal with fakes. Nobody can deal with a fake in the whole world. Serhi, you have the last word, the concluding word. So what I would like to say, once again, I am not a specialist, I'm not an expert, and so my point of view is maybe a dilettant point of view, but once again, I agree with Rob. Contra-propaganda cannot uh, achieve anything. Somebody in Ukraine, somebody from Ukrainian uh, politics, from civil society and media, think that uh, we have to create Ukrainian fakes to fight uh, Russian fakes. But you cannot make um, bigger lies than Russians make. We don't have to do it. We don't have to invent things that do not exist. I keep saying what I've been saying for five years. We have to uh, say the truth uh, fully and um, 
if we don't tell the 100 percent truth, it is a benefit for the Russia. We try to persuade ourselves of something, and this is the problem. And not the fact that this is a benefit for the Kremlin. It's actually all the same. They have the problems, but we have to deal with other problems. We have uh, to be honest and to be ready to say the truth. If we have problems, we have to speak about the problems. It is not a problem uh, to speak about it. The fear to acknowledge your problem is uh, a challenge. We have uh, very many people who are nice and, and uh, pro-Ukrainian, but they um, have the fear to speak the truth. And um, when I speak about it, um, I am called a left-oriented person. I would like to add, yeah, we spoke about um, the war. Um, it is a patriotic way to say the truth. Yes, but uh, you just try speaking about it in social media. You will get so much critics. This is the left, uh, the, le uh, the left point of view. Another thing y you have uh, spoken about is the ban of certain things. Uh, we also have to be honest about it, not from the point of view of emotion, it's a populism. Um, Ukraine restricts uh, the Russian context. It's very right, and it, this has no, nothing uh, to do with the censorship. Uh, to um, not to ban. Uh, artists who uh, perform uh, on the occupied Crimea, it's right, it's the matter of national security. Uh, the informational weapons is uh, part of Russian aggression. Uh, uh, Sergei already mentioned we cannot say more lies than Russian can, Russians can. Alexander Sushko, Executive Director of uh, International Renaissance Fund, Zora Balasani, Director of Public Television, Serhi Jadan, writer, and our wonderful moderator, Natalia Humeniuk. Thank you.